right, well, welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. Let's all stand. We'll turn to page. I didn't, I, I didn't even. 415. I didn't bring my book up here. <laughs> 415. All right, here we go. In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crowd and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle in the sacred place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. On the last, when the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, he will say, if we are faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it, Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm glad I'm little, aren't you? You can turn that down there. I think we all can hear pretty, pretty well to this, this evening. Amen. <laughs> we had to have it hot on Sunday. It's going to be back in church, isn't it? Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm going to go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Father, I ask that you'd uh, just put your hedge of protection around this building, Father, around our minds, our hearts, our thoughts. Father, I pray that we'd be focused. Father, we want to hear from you. Lord, we're excited, Father, as we look in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Father, we just give you all the praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's good to be back tonight. Amen. hope that you've had a good week so far. We've had a great week, amen. We appreciate the, the ladies of the church uh, getting the uh, cleaning uh, crew out there and taking a lot of stress off of Corinda. That really appreciate that. That means a lot to us. They did that today and uh, made sure I was out of the way. <laughs> and then uh, Miss Deborah asked me if they did a good job, and I'm typical male. I'm like, sure. <laughs> yeah. Where's my stuff? <laughs> so, yeah, don't don't fold my stuff. You put that right back where it goes. <laughs> amen. No, they did a good job, and I'm so thankful. Amen. Praise the Lord for that, and uh, I do appreciate that. That means a lot to us. That's huge for my wife. I know it didn't really bother me any. Right? We could live in a cabin, right? Be good w with a dirt floor. You never got to sweep it, brother. Isn't that great, OJ? You know the neat thing about a dirt floor, dirt gets hard after a time, but there's, where are you going to sweep dirt? Just let the crumbs go, amen? <laughs> I'm just teasing. But we are thankful for that. We do appreciate that. I hope Miss Deborah's watching. I do appreciate that. Remember uh, Mrs. Jan, if you would, in your prayer, she's uh, feeling nauseous tonight, so if you remember her in prayer, amen. It's good to have Twyla with us, amen. We keep praying for her and uh, her healing, and I, I guess God answered for the prayers about no pain, so, amen, amen right, <laughs> you know, that's one thing I ask for when I pray about uh, the surgery and stuff, I always ask the Lord for the pain to be minimal, but that's like us praying for the church building, uh, we, I don't know about you, in my mind it was a little, and then when we realized what God was doing, we're like, are you sure that's the, that's a little big, amen, <laughs> so God answers in a big way, so we, we appreciate that, amen, anybody else have a, a praise or a testimony tonight? Oh, yes, remember, Pat, we are going to pray for her in just a minute. 
Um, her blood pressure is really low. That's why Eldon's not here this, this evening. Uh, so he may be taking her to the hospital. They're watching her right now. She couldn't even get back into the bed. So um, we're going to wait and hear what happens. But we're going to lift her up in prayer here in just a minute. Does anybody have a, a prayer or a praise? I'd like to hear the praises. Amen. Amen. Yes, we do. And Christmas lights. We do now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amen. My, yeah, 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 yeah. Marcus, that's right. That was She lives down the street. Go on. You just walk on over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You hear that, Marcus? Bring your dish gloves. He wants you to do the dishes. <laughs> he said he'll bring paper plates and plastic silverware. No dishes. You throw them away. <laughs> Don't they say you can cook a turkey in a paper bag? Is that That's true, right? There you go, Marcus. You cook it in a paper bag. Throw that dude out. All right? No dishes, right? <laughs> that's a man's way. All right. Anybody else have a praise? Brother Jim? Amen. 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 Yeah, we've had a lot of people, and we're praying for that family that came on Sunday. And you know what's a blessing and uh, tells a lot about a church is when visitors, first-time visitors, are willing to talk. Now, I've been a first-time visitor. It's been a lot of years. Uh, but I wasn't too anxious to talk in front of people I never met. So that tells you a little bit about our church. And uh, that's two Sundays in a row we've had first-time visitors that gave testimonies. So that's a huge testimony for Lighthouse Baptist Church, and that means a lot. Amen. So that's amazing. But, yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else? Real quick. Is there anything I'm forgetting? Pray for Tommy. I think he goes in for a, a procedure tomorrow, right? Pray that it all goes well. Monday. Tomorrow. That's what I thought. Okay, you're going to have to go with him. Do your procedure. Make sure. Amen. <laughs> That's all right. Pray for him that they uh, see and every, everything goes good. And, and uh, boy, I'm telling you, all kinds of procedures. I'm just be honest. There's a lot of satanic smoke screens that are going around in our life. Whether we have our health issues or whatever it is. Uh, Satan likes to smoke screen us, and you say, what are you talking about? Well, anything that will get our focus off of the Lord, uh, that's a smoke screen. Now, uh, Job, uh, you know that Job went through worse than what we've ever even seen, and uh, he kept on reminding all those around him that God was the most important thing, even his best friends and his own wife, who was protected only because of Job. And his wife was the one person that Satan could not do anything to. Did you know that? even though she told Job to curse God and die. Now, that's, a, that's, that's his own wife. And yet, Job did not do that. So I want you to understand, there's all kinds of smoke screens, and not one of us have ever seen those kind that Job had to go through. Now, Job never got to see what Jesus went through either. So Job's no Jesus, just so you know. But Job's a good picture that we can do it. We can do it. And if we'll endure, the blessings are on the other side. And if you've not uh, studied the blessings that Job received, that's maybe what you should go look at. Not just the trials, but go see what God does when you endure and you keep your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he doubled everything he had. So uh, I think that he did pretty well, don't you? And uh, he gave God all the glory. Now his kids that had died went to heaven. Amen. And uh, that's where my son is. So praise the Lord. There is no better father than God the Father. Amen. And uh, God has a perfect will. And sometimes we don't understand what that is. But he does. And it's not for us to question. Yeah. 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 Amen. I hope the Lord can say that about us. Amen about us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is there anything I'm missing before we start prayer for Pat? I forgot. I hadn't forgot. All right. Anybody else got a praise? Good to have OJ tonight. Amen. Pray for him. I think your procedure's coming up too, right? When did you tell me? A Tuesday. Okay. Uh, they're going to do another eye procedure. They're trying to help uh, OJ's sight. This is a long 
short-term thing. So every time he does one, it's four weeks, six weeks, month. But it's supposed to eventually help clear it up. So that's what we're going to pray for, is that that will help clear it up. It will be easier for him to see at night. So, But let's pray for Pat, if you would, uh, if you'll pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we come before you again, before the throne of God. And, Father, we just want to lift Pat up to you, Father. We don't know what's going on with her body, but, Father, we know you do. Lord, we know that you have control of everything, and Lord, we seek your wisdom and your counsel, and Lord, we ask that you'd give uh, Eldon, Father, the wisdom that he needs to, to know what decisions to make, and Father, we ask that you'd just put your hand on her right now, Lord, as we're praying, there's more than three of us here gathered, and we're here in your name, and Father, we're lifting Pat up to you, and we ask that you put your hand on her body. Father, help her blood pressure to be maintained. And, Father, we know there's a lot of illnesses and a lot of uh, issues that she's been going through. And, Lord, we just ask you to just comfort her body. Father, heal her. And we ask it in the precious and the most powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God can do all things. Isn't that great? All right, well, let's sing one more song. Two thirty, yes. Yeah, I made it really difficult and embarrassing up here. All right, two thirty, here we go. Surely goodness and mercy. <laughs> the kind shepherd found me and now I am on my way home surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days all the days of my life surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. He restoreth my soul when I'm weary. He giveth me strength in the day. He leads me beside the still waters. He guards me each step of the way. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. On the last. When I walk through the dark, lonesome valley, my Savior will walk with me there. And safely his great hand will lead me to the mansions he's gone to prepare. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. James, will you make sure everyone has one of these? Amen. Praise the Lord. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Isn't that great? Praise the Lord. I was just thinking... 
Um, Brother Jim said he put the verses all over his office. Let me tell you, the Bible says he'll do his will. And that's how powerful the Word of God is. And uh, God's Word will do a lot of things if we'll just use it. And, uh, you know, what's interesting, the Lord told the Jews or Israel, He told them that they needed to put the Scriptures even on their doorposts, if you don't remember. And uh, they were to always have the Word of God in front of their face. And so if you say, well, why would you put Scriptures all over your office? Well, we have them all over our house and uh, should be all over your heart and all over your mind. Uh, because we always forget, and the power of the Word of God, that's what cleanses our mind, and we need it. Uh, I did want to share this with you uh, tonight, and we'll be talking about it again on uh, Sunday. One of our visitors purchased one of our church Bibles. Everyone knows who Bill is, right? He helps every Sunday to do the offering. Every Sunday, that little boy is so excited to come to church, rides on the bus, and, uh, and you know... I don't know if you know this, but he doesn't even, I don't even think he knows who his mom or dad is. Uh, but that little boy, is, he's so sweet and so happy, and, and uh, he loves to come. I love him to death. And uh, one of our visitors uh, that was with us saw him and was so, so enamored by his excitement and his joy to do the offering that they gave money to buy him a Bible. And uh, what we're going to do is she wants us to all sign it, so Corinna's going to write in it. And then we're going to all sign it, and then she wants me to take it over. And, and is it his grandma, Corinne, that he's living with? Aunt? Okay, so grandma. And so, and so we're going to go over there and give this to them. Is it his mom or not? It don't matter. We're going to take this over there and give this to him and present this to him uh, in front of his, his family. Amen? Isn't that neat? Amen. Amen. Hopefully this will be something that he'll want to cherish because uh, this is not a uh, cheap uh, gift by any means. So, But we're excited about that. Also, uh, for our anniversary, we do need to get that one done as well. We're going to sign one for uh, Brother uh, Don, uh, Bob Smith. I almost called him Don Smith, but we know a Don Smith, yeah. No, Don Smith, yeah, bearing precious seeds. But we are going to sign one for Bob uh, Smith, Pastor Bob Smith from Trinity Baptist Church, and we're excited to have him with us, amen, I hope that you're excited, we've got a lot of things coming up, amen, amen. praise the Lord, all right, does, I think, is there another chapter eight, is that, did you hand one out already, okay, okay, all right, well, praise the Lord, we're in Revelation chapter eight, we've had a good time so far, amen, and uh, for those of you that have missed we are on chapter 8, okay? Now, we have already talked a little bit about uh, chapter 8, verse number 1. Does everybody remember what that's about? Remember what chapter 7 is about? Just kind of a... I know you've probably... A lot has happened since last Wednesday, so you probably forgot everything, right? <laughs> so, huh? I did. You did? And I get to tell her all week. Still forgets, Paul. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, chapter seven was a uh, was a, uh, a parentheses chapter. Okay. Now, uh, if if you don't know what a parentheses chapter is, it is a uh, parentheses when you're doing English is an explanation. Okay. Usually, when you're writing a sentence and then all of a sudden you want to explain what was just said, you'll put a parentheses there and it'll be a short explanation, and then it'll and actually you can read it without reading the explanation. Don't recommend it. Unless you already know, right? Uh, and so what's interesting is we could skip chapter 7. But God was awesome enough and knew that we needed to have a little more explanation. And so that's basically what chapter 7 is. It explained the sealing of the Jews. It explained the fact that Dan and Ephraim was uh, not going to be protected during the tribulation. And uh, remember, we in chapter 5 or in chapter 6, we only went over the sixth seal. And there's seven. And so all of a sudden, chapter 7, in between the 6th seal and the 7th seal, and we're like, what's going on, right? Okay, and so in chapter number 8, we found out that, hey, that verse number 1 is where the 7th seal is opened. Now, the other thing that we learned that's not in your notes, I hope you wrote down, Revelations chapter 4 and verse number 1, to Re go ahead and write this down if you don't have it, because you're going to want to remember this. Revelations chapter 4, verse 1, to Revelations chapter 8 and verse number uh, 1 or thereabouts. It's in chapter 8, will be the uh, first three and a half years of the tribulation. 
And so uh, now you can feel like a Bible scholar because most people have no clue uh, when scripturally when the second three and a half years start. Amen. And you know what's interesting is it's really not that hard to figure that out. Okay. And you say, why is that? Well, because the first six seals that Jesus opens in that scroll are man-induced issues. Okay. So while the church is in heaven... Since Revelation chapter 4, verse number 1, the church was raptured into heaven. We're in heaven. The tribulation started. So Revelation chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 8 is the first three and a half years. And all the things that we've seen in those first six seals have been man self-inflicted. Amen. Now, we were, I was just talking about that. Most of the time, the things we go through are what? Well, we want to blame we want to blame everything, don't we? Yeah. Oh, Satan made me do it. Oh, really? He did. When's the last time you were his puppet? Right? I mean, we, you know, well, if you wouldn't have, if you wouldn't have made me mad, right? No, if you would have just chilled your jets, right? Amen. You know, uh, we like to blame everybody instead of take the heat. Amen. Uh, so, any, anyways, uh, what's interesting we can learn from that is that we can learn that most of the time uh, we're going through hardships are the hardships we put ourselves into. Now, this is something I do want to go back over again. Uh, if you want to take your seventh seal paper or a blank paper put it on the back of the first page of chapter 8, whatever you want to do. Uh, but this is important. Um, I'm going to go over this really quick, the first seal. Uh, and what was interesting, this is something you don't learn. Uh, you're never going to learn. This is extra deep, okay? And so this is a lot uh, more than you would ever learn from any Revelations class, okay? What I'm going to show you about the first six seals, because they represent Jesus, Revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of him. The word re re revelation means to reveal himself. Okay. Now, who is he revealing himself to? Yes, and also who else? It's all about Jews. Tribulation is all about the Jews. Okay. But it's also a reflection of his character, his deity, everything is his sovereignty. And what's interesting is as John entered into uh, uh, heaven, remember when he raptured up into heaven in verse number one of chapter number four, the very first thing he saw, uh, uh, one of the very first things he saw was cherubs around the throne of God. And those cherubs had what? Four faces, okay? And you know what's interesting is uh, most people are all sci-fi. But you got to remember, this is the revelation of, uh, I should answer that and put him on the mic and see if he gets embarrassed. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> anyways, the revelation of, I actually had someone call me while I was preaching at the college, and, uh, uh, and I, I actually answered it. I know the other preachers could not believe I answered my phone. And it was, it was a, I can't remember if it was a missionary or something, but I answered it right while I was preaching. I says, you know, I'm preaching right now in the college. Oh, oh, oh. oh. And I, <laughs> it, yeah, it was, yeah, that was pretty funny. Any, anyways, I'm sure those preachers didn't think that was very funny, but he won't call me anymore. Make sure I'm not preaching. But All right, so the first seal, and they all represent Christ. Now, the first four that we're going to talk about, the first four speak of Christ's four uh, characters or his character traits okay and uh, there are four types of character traits that Jesus has and those four the first four seals um, also what's interesting is uh, they're the first four books of the Bible so if you look at the first seal and we all know that each one represents Jesus but the first seal is Matthew which is a lion. Now remember, the first face that, the, uh, uh, that John seen when he looked at the cherub was the lion. Remember, the face of a lion. Now you say, why in the world did John see these different faces? Because they were all to represent Jesus. He's not, it's not the revelation of cherubs. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen? The Jesus Christ. The only one that matters. Okay. And so as he looks at them, and, and you say, well, what does the cherubs look like? I have no idea. I'm about ready to fall. I have no idea what they look like. Okay, does that matter? Are they going to have those faces when we see them? I have no idea. Maybe. Because they represent, and their, their, their significance is nothing. 
Remember, the Bible says, lift the name of Jesus high and you'll draw all men. It's all about Jesus. And if you'll understand that, that's the most important thing. should be in your life. It's not what you have. Your agenda is not important. And what we can learn from these cherubs is that Jesus is the most important one. So the first seal represented Matthew, the book of Matthew, which is Jesus as king or a lion. And what we've learned from that is he's a promise-keeping savior. Aren't you glad? He keeps his promise, amen? Uh, you know, isn't that great? Once you're saved, you don't have to worry about not being saved again, right? He said he's going to rapture us one day, amen? He said he's going to give us a new body. Every, he doesn't lie. He's a promise-keeping Savior. The second seal that represents Jesus, and we're not going to go over all the things that happened, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And, I mean, uh, all the apocalypse means is a revelation. Did you know that? So they're, they're, they're actually pointing to Christ as well, just so you know. Amen. So the second seal represents Jesus as the book of Mark. And uh, there he is a, uh, the picture that they see on the cherub was an ox. And that is a, uh, that, that is a servant, which means that Jesus is an all-powerful savior. One of the most powerful beasts is an ox. Amen. Take my yoke. It's light. Jesus can handle it all, amen. I, uh, I know, I don't, I, I love this, uh, uh, I love that uh, ever since I seen it, and it was a long time ago when I was young, and it was a very impactful to me, but I remember seeing a picture, and we don't know what Jesus looks like, but it said, bench press this, the sins of the world, and uh, oh my word, uh, he didn't have to bench press it, he carried it. It wouldn't have mattered. He took it. He took it to hell. He took it to Hades. He, he has the keys both to death and hell. And that's where you said, I wonder where he put them, put them at. He put them in hell. That's where they belong, all of our sins. The third, the third seal represents Jesus as in the book of Luke. And in the book of Luke is him as a man. That was the third face that they saw in the cherub. And that's a picture of a perfect Savior. Perfect Savior. The fourth seal was uh, Jesus, as in the book of John. John is, uh, represents uh, 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 Jesus as like the eagle. Because remember, they saw the eagle. And uh, actually, if you think about that, that is Jesus as God. Because just as an eagle, what can they do up high? God sees everything. You say, why would God, why would it be an eagle? Because eagles, man, just think, let me, I don't know about you, aren't you, I'm fascinated by their vision. Can you imagine having that kind of eyesight? I mean, to be that high up and to see such a small creature and to dive down like that and swoop it up, amen? Aren't you glad that God doesn't swoop us up when we're <laughs> acting like creatures? So the fourth seal is Jesus as the book of John, uh, as an eagle or God, a personal savior, and uh, you know it's interesting when we talk about him as a personal savior, this shows his thoughts. You say, why is that? Because in John, uh, God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Amen. What's his thoughts, do you think? Remember, in John chapter 3, what a great chapter because it says that he came uh, to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to condemn the world. So I think that we know what Jesus' thoughts are. I know we like to try to think that we know what God's thoughts are when we don't, all right? The fifth seal represented Jesus in his great sacrifice uh, because of the sacrificial altar that was in heaven. And what was below that sacrificial altar in chapter number 5, which chapter 5 is seal number 5, uh, right below that altar of what? Jesus' blood. And what was under there? The martyred saints since we were in heaven. Okay, So when we are raptured to heaven... There were people who were saved during that first three and a half years who were killed or martyred. So John looks over and he sees underneath the altar in chapter number 5 and he says, Who are those wearing white raiment? Remember? And Jesus lets us understand who they are. They are the martyred saints. They're blood washed. But they don't have their bodies and it says, Jesus says that he looks over at them at the end of chapter 5, and he says they won't get their bodies till the rest of the martyred saints are martyred. 
And you say, well, you know what's interesting about that? That means our soul has a human figure. Our soul also wears raiment, means clothing. But you know what raiment we wear, our soul wears when we get saved? Not what you're wearing. We wear Christ's robes. Our soul is eternal. Amen. You say, man, I wish I could have that raiment. It never gets dirty. Well, we're in our carnal bodies. We don't get to touch that. Amen. But it's over our soul, that which is eternal. So that's interesting. And uh, the seal, the fifth seal. Now, these are things I'm giving you that aren't in your notes. OK, just so you know, the sixth seal, which is chapter number six. Did I lose my mic? No. OK. Uh, was Jesus divine wrath. OK. So uh, the sixth seal is a picture of Jesus' divine wrath. You say, what's going on here? Well, after the fourth seal, the cherubs were out of it, okay? And uh, in the, in the, after the fifth, when all those, mar all those saints were being killed on earth, for what? For preaching the kingdom. Now, they are preaching the kingdom because that's what happens next, the millennial kingdom. We're not preaching the kingdom. People that are preaching that are, are just don't know their Bible, okay? We're not preaching the kingdom. The kingdom preaching doesn't happen until the church is taken out, amen? This isn't the kingdom. The millennial kingdom happens after the tribulation. The church is in heaven, amen? Uh, we're still preaching repentance. All right, so, but anyways, uh, the seventh seal, which is in uh, chapter 8. Remember, chapter 7 is not skipped, Chapter 7 is just an exclamation or a, an explanation. But the seventh seal is Jesus in his divine mourning. Now, you say, where did you get that? Well, if you look and open your Bibles to Revelations chapter 8 where we belong. <coughs> now, in order to understand this, I, I'm not trying to make it longer. I'm just trying to make sure you get it, okay? Okay. Now, I study it a lot more than you do, and so if I, if I have to go over it several times and you only go over it once, that means you're, 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 I want to make sure you get it, all right? So chapter 8, if you look at verse number 1, and uh, look at verse number 1 with me, and it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was what? Silence. Silence. Now, we've already went over this, but I still want to explain. In heaven... For about a space of a half hour. Now, so what's interesting, you say, well, why, why do you think that that would be uh, Jesus' divine mourning? Uh, because I want you to understand something. Jesus' wrath is kindled in chapter 6 because of the fact that in chapter 5, uh, during that time, they killed all the Christians. And they've been blaspheming him. And they've been looking up to heaven and cursing God while he's on the throne. And it says that they see him on the throne. And they say they would rather die than turn to Jesus. Now, that doesn't make no sense. All this nastiness is going on. Death and everything that's going on. And I'm just saying, it's just because we have hard times right now, they ain't hard. Amen. People are still cursing God, still using His name in vain today. Still are. And they don't care if you go to church and, hey, you just lose your job, buddy. If you're going to go to church, that's, you, hey, I want you to work. If you don't want to work, you can just leave. Amen. I don't know if that's still the case. I know there's a lot of places that are like that. Uh, but it's even worse than that. Amen. And so here we have Jesus' wrath is kindled. That doesn't mean that he has exuberant his, or, or had given his wrath yet. He hasn't. He's upset and angry more so than he would be with a child of God because this world who's turned its back on him and he's revealing himself to them and they know it and they still refuse him and they still kill the ones that are proclaiming him. All right. He takes a pause. Remember we talked about that. Why would God want to take a pause? I think this, because the Bible said God so loved the world. You remember, you, you uh, cursed God as well. You ran from God. You spit on him. You've done all kinds of things in, to him as well. And yet, he still paused for you. And let me tell you, all of heaven will be silent for 30 minutes. And God is pausing during that time, giving them a little bit more time. They know they're in trouble. Okay, now notice, all the way up until the, the first three and a half years, God hasn't sent nothing down. This has been a misconception. 
This has been not taught correctly. The first three and a half years of tribulation has nothing to do with God's judgment. It's been self-inflicted judgment. It's been worldly chaos brought on by worldly cares and worldly allowance, right? So God is mad here, and he has a time of mourning in chapter 8 and verse number 1 and 30 minutes, amen? All right, so we've already looked at that in our notes. If you look down at your notes, we're all the way down. Uh, let's see. We left off on E, Roman numeral number 1, A, B, C, D, and E. We did talk a little bit about the trumpets, uh, and uh, just just a little heads up on D. We talked about the seven trumpets, and, or the, there's trumpets and what trumpets were used for. And uh, the seven trumpets were given to seven angels. Uh, we read that here after uh, God gives the, there's seven angels that get seven trumpets. Isn't that cool? And there was seven seals, okay? Now there'll be seven trumpets, and then there'll be seven vials, and then there'll be the end. And we'll come and we'll beat them all up. We won't do nothing. The Lord will destroy them all. Destroy all those who blaspheme and turn their back on the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we found out as we looked underneath D, we see that the trumpets uh, were uh, used to announce things. The first thing they were used to announce was a summon to worship. And the reason why I'm going over this again, because I think it's important for us to understand that these aren't just things that uh, uh, that's going on in heaven, but these are things that should be going on today on, in earth in the church. Okay, these aren't things that God is just wanting for heaven to proclaim. Now, listen, uh, the trumpet is supposed to be you. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He also said we have voices like trumpets. Okay, we're supposed to proclaim Christ. Amen. The problem isn't that the world has turned their back on Christ per se. The problem is, is that the church has lost and forgot to proclaim him. If we had louder trumpets who lived the life, we would have more people getting saved. It's not that there's more saved people, it's that there's more lost people. There's more fake repentance, false repentance. Remember, Judas was a disciple. And he preached, and he cast out demons, and he did all kinds of miracles with Jesus' power, yet he was lost. Are you listening? Judas Iscariot, yes, the one who sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, was lost. And the Bible says that he went to his place, meaning hell. That means that when Judas killed himself by hanging himself, instead of getting right with the Lord, let me admit, wait a minute, I want you to back up. Peter denied Christ and cursed right in front of the Lord. That he didn't know him. But Jesus forgave him. Okay. Now, I don't know what's worse. Or is selling someone out. Jesus would have forgave Judas. Judas took himself to his own place. You see what I'm saying? That's not... It's going to make me cry. That's not the place that Jesus wanted Judas So don't, don't you sit there and say, well, you know, he could have never got saved. No, he could have got saved. And you know what's interesting about this is, this is that's the same Jesus we see here during the tribulation, is that he's trying to get people saved. He doesn't want anyone to perish. That's what the Bible says. He wants all to be saved. But we choose to go there. Don't mourn. When someone chooses to go to, you can't force them. Can you force someone to do something they don't want to? Not really, really, can you? You can force them to go to church, but it doesn't mean it changes their heart. And so here we see the, the, the three things that we just looked at three. The three things they used for the trumpet was the summon to worship. I think that the Christian needs to begin to blow that trumpet. Uh, we have a great place to worship. We should be getting people here. Amen. That's our great commission, not the pastor's. It is ours. Amen. I'm blowing my trumpet right now. Amen. Uh, number two. <laughs> right? I am. Amen. You know, you think it's hard to, to preach to... Uh, lost people, you try to preach to Christians. 
They're harder. What do you mean? They're harder. Number two, uh, the, the trumpet was used as an alarm to signal for danger. Let me tell you, if that alarm doesn't be signaled right now, you're, you, there's something wrong with you. There's a great danger coming, and it's called the, the uh, rapture. And you say, why is that a danger? Well, because if they had opportunity to get saved before the rapture comes, they'll never have an opportunity to ask Jesus Christ in their heart ever again. And the Bible is clear on that. Number three, the trumpet was used for anointing of a king. Amen. He's already anointed. Amen. You know what he's going to do after the tribulation? He's going to find himself on the throne. And he will live as king. And he'll reign and will reign with him. But there are things that happen right now that we've got to take care of that we're not. Number, letter E. We're going to look at verse number 3 of chapter number 8. It says, and another angel. Do you see that? So we've already looked at seven angels, and they all received a, what, trumpet in verse number three. And I saw seven angels in verse number two, I mean, uh, which stood before God, and to them were given, what, seven trumpets. And verse number three says, and another angel, so an eighth one. Well, there's a lot more than eight angels in heaven. Remember, only a third of them fell to earth with Lucifer long before you were born, long before the earth was created. Come on. They're pretty smart. So we see here in verse number 3, another angel came and stood at the altar having a what? <clears throat> Amen. You know, I looked all over to find a replica of a golden censer. And I was so tickled. You know what I kept finding? How many knows what a golden censer is? What's the first? Miss Julie, you should know. The Catholics. But you know that that's a Catholic version. That's not what the golden censer looks like. How do you uh, open it and dip it on a chain? That's not the censer that the Bible speaks of. A golden censer is, this is a miniature, but a golden censer is like a cup with a lid. And uh, what we're going to see here in a minute is we're going to see this angel is given this golden censer. Oh, this makes me cry. What do you think the golden altar is for? Remember... He said that the martyred saints had prayed in their prayers. And I, I'm going to share a little bit about with you. And, and that angel is given this censer here. And notice how that lid opens up. Now, this may not be an exact replica of what's in heaven, but this gives us an idea. Now, I already know that this is a mini one for Smurf. Uh, but I couldn't find one large for the life of me. So I don't know why I couldn't find a large one. Wouldn't that have been neat? I would have loved to have had a large ornate one. Those types of things I like. There you go. There's an idea. I think that's amazing, okay? Uh, but what, what's going to happen is this, this angel is given this by Jesus. That's pretty special, isn't it? Amen. Amen. And, and what it does is pretty special, too. What it does is pretty special. I'm, I'm going to set it here. You can look at it later, uh, but I'll set it right there. And I think that, I love that. I think that's just amazing. And I'm excited to go over that here. The angel at the altar. We're, <clears throat> I want to read to you some uh, extra notes that I have written. Well, I'm dropping things everywhere. And... Uh, but anyways, in verse number one, the following the silence in heaven, John, John saw a seven angels of the official importance for they stand in the presence of God uh, can you imagine that standing in God's presence now we're going to be right there if you're saved this is the church age we're there in front of the altar or in front of the throne isn't that awesome and we're not only there we're there by the cherubs but we ain't going to care about them we're there with Jesus when it says that the lamb is the only one that can open the seals and then we see the Lamb of God hand out the seven trumpets. Isn't that cool? Well, I don't even know what the trumpets look like. All we can do is kind of guess, right? Who knows if they're straight or the curled ones? We don't know. Does it matter? And then it says the trumpets are used to call to war, to worship, for convocation of the people, to proclaim festivals as the year of Jubilee, the Feast of the Tabernacles, and for judgments. And then these seven angels prepared themselves to sound. That is, they took the trumpets that were handed them to, to, and took up their positions where they could in turn sound their trumpets. 
But before the trumpets were sounded, John saw another angel with a golden censer in his hand. Uh, come and stand before the golden incense altar. Isn't that amazing? I like that, don't you? Remember, uh, the Lord uh, uh, says this over and over in the Word of God, how our prayers are like a sweet what? Yeah, and incense, amen. Now remember, they burnt incense in the tabernacle, remember? And that incense would go up to heaven. That was a picture of our prayers. And Think about that for just a minute. And you know what God thinks that is? You're like, how does that smell? It's precious to him. It's not your little incense thing that you have at home. Prayers, I mean real prayers by real saints. Now, uh, this isn't, uh, Lord, uh, I bless my food, uh, amen. Uh, that, that isn't really, I mean, think about that. Is that incense? No. Do you really think that's a sweet, sweet relationship or bond? Amen. I think that, I'm just trying to be honest, okay? I think that we really haven't had that great of relationship, right, that we should unless something traumatic happens, then all of a sudden God has us on our back and then we're weeping and we wonder where he is, right? The Lord longs for that prayer. And notice the golden incense altar, the, the name of this angel priest. I like how he calls him that because isn't this was the priest's job in the tabernacle, amen? And so this angel priest is not given, uh, and it's useless uh, to speculate as to who he was. You, you, interesting is the angels are not important, are they? Some claim it was Christ, but it's not him because he's our great high priest, but that is immaterial. We're told that he was given much incense and that he offered uh, with it the prayers of all the saints. And these saints were the saints of the tribulational period, and their prayers were the deliverance uh, from their enemies. Now, uh, what's interesting, let's go back to our Bible in verse number 8. Look down, let's read verse 4, and uh, we're going to look at verse 5. And verse 6, so do you have your Bible open still? All right, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets did what? prepared themselves to sound amen and so let's go ahead and uh, look at our notes here e the angel at the altar number uh, one under that this angel associated with worship of god by the people of god i love this angel i think he's special number one we see the altar in heaven this altar is mentioned seven times in the book in revelations chapter six and verse number nine eight three eight five nine thirteen 14, 18, and 16, 7. Isn't that neat? Seven times. Do you think the Lord likes seven? It appears to be associated with the prayers of God's people. Thus, corresponding to the altar of incense and the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that's amazing, isn't it? Number two, we have the golden censer. In the earthly tabernacle, the golden censer was used to carry what? the fire from the altar into the Holy of Holies, where the incense was added. Amen. You know what's interesting? Uh, there's going to be uh, <laughs> some fire and stuff going on during tribulation, isn't there? And actually, if you think about it, uh, uh, the Bible talks about us being purified by fire. But usually when we're talking about that, not just hail fire, but tribulation fire, meaning that when we get put in a bind or when we get trouble, and their trouble is going to be worse than we've ever seen, talk about being purified with fire, amen? Come on, right? And uh, people are, are, I don't know why they wouldn't turn to the Lord, because fire is supposed to purify you to turn where? Amen. Some through the fire. Amen. All right. Number three, the incense. The tabernacle, the incense spoke of the perfections of what? Christ. Now, uh, perfume or a sweet smell 
only due to Christ's righteousness because he is our advocate. Uh, 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 look on number, number four. The mingling of incense and prayers of the saints. Here's a wonderful understanding of our prayers in heaven's point of view. I, I, I like how it's worded. Our stammering prayers are made beautiful and worshipful as they are mixed with what? Okay, so here we have in that uh, the altar, we are have a mixture of God's perfections and our prayers. His incense, which would be perfection, and our stammeringness. See what Christ does for us? Now, I want you to understand something. It's not that Christ doesn't hear you. It's in His time. It's not that he has not heard. How many died in the first three and a half years? And actually, we are, it's only going to be three and a half, and then there's going to be three and a half of, of Jacob's trouble. And that's when that's the last is Jacob's trouble, because that's when it gets hot. But just so you know, I mean, uh, there's been a lot, okay? How many people, uh, when they were in e Egypt... How many years was that? And they prayed and they prayed. Did God not hear their prayers? It's in God's time. But God gives a time here. Three and a half years. And God has all the prayers, doesn't he? And he mixes all those prayers of those martyrs. And this is where it really hit home for me. He mixes those prayers from them martyrs. And he mixes them with the righteousness of Christ, which is the incense. And he scoops that fire up out of that altar with that incense. And that angel takes him over. And that's the beginning of the wrath. And he dumps that down there. You know what happened? What, was, what the Lord took as a sweet smelling savor. And turns it into judgment on those. He's answering. It's not our job to revenge. Are you listening to me? It's your job to pray because only one that has can do revenge or if it's even what he wants is up to him. Don't think that he sits up in heaven going, yep, he's taking one for the team. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. He does not like seeing his children disrespected. I've heard preachers say, well, I, I want to be close to you because lightning might strike. You know what? That's not a joke. That is not a joke. God does not like his children to be hurt or mocked. Now, he'll allow it, but only for a time. I don't know about you. I, I just thought that that was so precious. And, and thinking about that angel having that golden censer. And I was looking all over the Internet to find something. And I was like, oh, my word, can you imagine? And that's why it's got all the holes in it. Because when he picks it up, there's going to be smoke coming out. And I've got the lid. And he's waiting for Jesus to tell him to go put it on the earth. And it still smells good. Can you imagine? I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. I wrote this, our stammering prayers are made beautiful and worshipful as they are mixed with the perfections of Christ. This is the power to produce effects. Are you listening? You should write that right by that number four. Our power to produce an effect. All right? I'm trying to teach you something. If our prayers are that powerful, if we would really pray, we could see some action some change we could because the bible says we have not because we or we've asked amiss now is that is you say well i've asked for a lot of things but obviously we're not asking right or actually uh, that we also read that verse in the bible in psalms where it says if we have iniquity in our heart he can't hear us and uh, you know I'm, I'm telling you if we don't get the sin that's in our heart right and we can pray all we want but he's not listening That reminds me when I, when I, if I, well, it's been a long time, I think. I don't know. My wife is so used to me irritating her. So, but I know that when we were uh, newly together, I would do something dumb and it would make my wife upset. 
And uh, I, don't, I don't know if your, your wife's that way, but she'd be upset, and she just wouldn't talk to me, and that was it. I'm like, all right, I'm sorry, and it didn't matter. She, she was making me uh, get the silent treatment, and that's fun, isn't it, Brother Jim? I, it's, it's awesome, and I, I feel like I'm living by myself. You know, I'm like, well, what the heck? Are you going to ever talk to me? What does that mean? So I try all these weird things because I'm a pretty big jokester, and so I, I would start, Corinda. I know that that would drive her nuts because I've always called her Corinne, and, uh, and uh, finally she would start laughing, and it would you know, break the silence. But I didn't like that. I didn't like it. But I'm, wait a minute. We do that to God. We do, and he takes a lot more. We've done a lot more to him. And our country needs us. You know, our grandkids need us. Our kids need us. And you know where they need us? At the altar. I don't know why we're ashamed to go to the altar. You know, if you're ashamed to go to the altar, we're going to be standing before it. You know, the, the, main, the saints that are going to be killed in the tribulation are going to be dancing under it. And we're going to be enamored. The altar is what it's all about. It's not a place of shame. It's a, it's a place, of, you know, when we come down to the altar, everyone's like, oh, I don't want to do that. Why not? We're all going to be before the altar together. What do you, what's the big deal? We can't do it here. Why would we do it there? Are we going to do it there? Are we saved? Because the altar is a place of praise. Praise God for the altar. There's a power that produces an effect. It converts men from sin and counteracts disease. That's called prayer. Prayer. You say, preacher, I need you to come talk to somebody. I think they just need to get saved. And I'm telling you that, you know what we need to do? You need to pray for them. You know, I think that uh, people think that I have some kind of uh, special power when it comes to prayer. Or maybe Krenda has some special power for prayer outside of what you have when in all reality if uh, if you would just get right with God and pray you have the same availability of power that we have and uh, obviously uh, you need to get right don't I'm saying because you need to have a prayer life you do you got to have a prayer life number letter F I gotta watch the clock oh my word we're running out of time uh, letter F the efficacy of prayer, that E F F I C A C Y. That's what that word means. What I was giving you. The power to produce effects. Efficacy. How many use that every day? Hmm. Amen. The prayers in question here would be those. Saved during Daniel's 70th week. Now, what's Daniel's 70th week? I'm going to ask you this even though we already know it. Come on, don't, don't say me don't know. Tribulation. That's just another name for the seven-year tribulation. And, and remember, he was calling it a week, okay? That's seven years, okay? And we already learned all of that. So that's the same thing as the seven-year tribulation, all right? It is as these prayers ascended to the throne of God that the answer... Does what? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> That's awesome. The prayer which has been upon the lips of God's children. Thy kingdom come in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 10 is now about to be answered. Amen. Uh, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Now, here's another uh, uh, message for you. The kingdom that he's calling or praying about is the what? Millennial kingdom, amen? So, uh, it, it, you know what? We're not praying for the millennial kingdom uh, we're, because we're, we're, the millennial kingdom happens after the tribulation, right? Okay, uh, we need to pray that people get saved before the rapture. We really do. We need to get them saved. We need to get them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we, we, you know what? A lot of people have already heard that. I was told that the Metroplex area was, what, 80% churched. That don't mean they're 80% saved. That means they, over 80% of the people in the Metroplex, that's a lot of people, almost 7 million, have already heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So out of that 7 million people, who all you think going to heaven? Yeah, very few. That's a shame. That's a shame. All right, the, uh, so uh, we got to call it there. I, I know that's awful. So i got a pen 
So we'll quit on G. We're going to look at the, the signal for an angelic action. The signal for an angelic action. We'll start in G. And uh, we should be able to get to the first trumpet. But this is not next Wednesday. We won't have uh, services next Wednesday uh, due to Thanksgiving. We always have that Wednesday off for people that are traveling and whatnot, have their family over. Who all is going out of town? Anybody? Are you? Okay. Well, you travel safe, all right? I know kids are out of school all week next week, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, we get our grandkids for a few days as long as I can handle them. Maybe I can lose the rest of my hair in the back. No. <laughs> Jesus. All right, let's all stand. We'll close in a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for this time that we can look in Revelation. And, Father, as we see more of you, and uh, what a blessing, Father, as we've looked and uh, seen this uh, next angel, Lord, with the golden censer. And, Father, realizing, Lord, that he's scooping up our prayers mixed with your uh, essence, so to speak, your power, your righteousness. And, Father, what, a, what an amazing thing we see there of the, the, how important our prayers are to you and, Father, that you do hear. You do listen, Father, if we uh, make sure that we're right with you. And that, uh, Father, not only do you hear, but you see what's going on around us. And, Lord, we know that uh, you do care. And, Father, we're so thankful for that. And, Lord, I pray that we had learned something tonight. And, Father, be excited, Lord, to share it with others. And, Lord, before it's ever too late, Lord, as we look around, we know that you're coming home soon. And, Father, we, uh, those of us who are saved are excited for that. But, Lord, uh, we are kind of leery because we know people that we love that don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. And, Lord, even now as we're praying, I pray the Holy Spirit of God would just uh, give us the power that we need, Lord, that they would not be able to turn their back on you any longer, Father, that they would get saved before it's ever too late. Father, we love you. We ask you to give us a good night's rest. Father, we ask you to continue to put your hand on Miss Pat. Father, heal her body. Lord, we don't know what's going on. Father, we hope that then pray that there's a good report. Father, be with Eldon and Donna as they're with her. And Lord, we just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.